to this lesson 5 of the Civil Rights in the USA 1865 to 1992 course. This lesson is going to focus on how we synthesize the knowledge and the analysis that we have learned so far. You will need with you your lesson notes template, so that will be uh, an email to you, or you can find it on class charts, or failing that, you will be able to follow a link to it in the description at the bottom of this video. So, let's make a start. Okay, we're going to start with a little bit of recap. Start getting us to think about how we can synthesize some of the information here. You have a table, this is on the second page of your lesson notes template. Ask you to think about social rights, political rights and economic rights. And it gets you to think about how much change was there between 1865 to 1918 and why. So have a go at doing that from memory. Um, and then you, will ha you have on page 3, 4 and 5 of your lesson notes template some revision maps to help you. So pause this now and have a go. So the important thing to think about is the extent of change over time. Okay, that's really important with synthesis. How much change was there and why? And the why bit, as well as the how much change, is what brings the synthesis. So what we know is that in 1865, with the beginning of Reconstruction, with the Radical Republicans in control of the Reconstruction process, we know that there were efforts to make huge changes in the lives of African Americans, both social, political and economic. We also know that African Americans themselves struggled tirelessly to try and embody the freedom and equality that they had been given by the federal government and to try and carve out a meaningful um, existence to try and breathe some sort of life into that freedom and equality. However, we know that by the time we get to 1918, um, a lot of the rights and a lot of the progress from earlier on in this period had been eroded by the f lack of interest now from the federal government, by the very hostile forces of white southerners, anti-civil rights forces, and that by 1918 the position of African Americans in, in the US society does not look particularly positive and it doesn't look as though much progress has been made. But we must remember that the fortunes of African Americans don't go on a straight line of progress from the start of the period to the end of the period, but that instead what we see are competing forces and different factors that allow African Americans sometimes the ability to push further forward for their rights in some periods than in others. And it's that interplay of factors and change over time which is really the, the element of synthesis that answers in essay questions on this paper are looking to address. Okay, we are now going to move on to um, a more detailed recap of the chronology of events that you've looked at so far in this course. So reconstruction, then the emergence of Jim Crow segregation, looking at also how anti-civil rights forces played a part in that and how they were consistent over the period, and then finally a recap on the First World War and on the Great Migration which began in 1915 in earnest. So you'll find this table on page 6 of your lesson notes template. You're going to use it um, as you watch the little clips that are coming up that give a, a recap of some of the key chronological and some of the key factors that we have looked at. So. A key chronology, we looked at reconstruction and Jim Crow and anti-civil rights forces and African American leadership and then the First World War and the Great Migration. And there are also obviously factors at play within each of those chronological periods that we've looked at. Some of those, we've looked at them generally in chronological order, but there's also overlap between them. And that's why the factors are important to see how the factors um, are more or less important in different parts of the chronological period. So you're looking to make a note of what the key developments are in each area and I suggest that you pause it after each of the little um, recaps, make some notes and then move on to the next one. The reconstruction period saw monumental change. If we think about the point of departure for African Americans in 1865, where millions of African Americans were slaves, 
and were then freed from that slavery by the 13th Amendment in January of 1865. Uh, then Reconstruction period brings huge change to African Americans. African Americans who had been um, slaves for generations, who had been dominated by the white civil elite, who had been owned as property. So the Reconstruction Amendments and the end to that ownership of people was hugely significant and we mustn't underestimate the importance of Reconstruction for that monumental change in the lives of African Americans. That, in many respects, was the beginning of the struggle for freedom, certainly to um, for that freedom to embody something, to, for it to mean something that started with the end of slavery. And we know that the main drivers behind the changes in Reconstruction, apart from African Americans themselves, were radical Republicans in Congress. And we know that those radical Republicans in Congress wanted to remake the South and wanted to give equality to African Americans. And so the 13th Amendment and the 14th Amendment and the 15th Amendment are huge changes because of the civil and political rights they give to African Americans. And we know that there was a struggle in Congress over this and there was considerable resistance to these changes among white southerners. There was something of a, um, a game of political ping pong between radical republicans in Congress and between the white southern governments as the Congress tried to expand the rights of African Americans and white southerners try to push back against that. So for the Black Codes and the activities of the Ku Klux Klan, Congress fought back with the 14th Amendment, with the Force Acts. At every turn, when Congress tried to advance the rights of African Americans, white Southerners pushed back against this. Now, of course, Reconstruction was a struggle between white Americans so radical republicans in the north, white southerners over the future of the country, but we mustn't deny agency to African Americans themselves who pushed for their own equality, who served in state legislatures, over 2,000 of them, who served in the Senate, who tried incredibly hard to breathe meaning into their freedom and to try and live out a sense of equality in the face of white southern resistance and it was not only um, on the ground in the south where this resistance to black equality and to the advance of African American rights existed the Congress uh, continually came up against pressure from yes state governments in the south but also came under pressure from the president. So Andrew Johnson, who was president after Abraham Lincoln and before President Grant, had a very different idea as to what Reconstruction should look like. And Andrew Johnson denounced the 14th Amendment. He tried to stop radical Republicans from improving the lives of African Americans in any meaningful way. And so right from the beginning, whether it be Republicans in Congress versus the President, whether it be African Americans themselves in communities in the South versus the Ku Klux Klan, whether it be Radical Republicans versus white Southern governments, there was a struggle over Reconstruction. There was a struggle over the future of African Americans. And ultimately, this was a struggle that was lost. Ultimately, Reconstruction is abandoned in African Americans freedom and equality is abandoned as a result but we mustn't forget some of the important advances made by African Americans themselves. Education and the development of black education was crucial which started during the reconstruction period. African Americans building their own churches and their own community which was also crucial for sustaining them through 
the period of terrible injustice that emerged with Jim Crow segregation. So, yes, Reconstruction, when it's abandoned, is terrible for African Americans, but we mustn't forget the struggle that they took part in. We mustn't forget the importance of the developments that took place during Reconstruction. We know, obviously, that in the shape of the Ku Klux Klan that emerged in Reconstruction as a way of trying to stop African Americans from exercising their right, that white Southerners tried to stop black people from enjoying the rights of the 14th and the 15th Amendment, and we know that Congress had to fight back against that. We know also that there were terrible examples of racial violence. We know that lynching was rife in the South. We know that white Southerners psychologically had not given up. You know, they may have lost on the battlefield, they may have lost the war, but they didn't change their attitude towards African Americans and towards the federal government just because they had lost the war. And the sense of white Southerners wanting to stay in control of the South and the impact that that had on African Americans is also a really important story of Reconstruction. And another part of this narrative of what happened was the lack of help for economic rights for African Americans. We know that the Radical Republicans did not favour wealth redistribution. They did not want to um, give land to African Americans. And so this left many African Americans tied to the same soil that they'd laboured on during the days of slavery and tied to contracts with the same white landlords that had been their masters during slavery. So what we see in this reconstruction period is it's really what W.E.B. Du Bois spoke about when he said that uh, African Americans enjoyed a brief moment in the sun. Um, the promise of the Reconstruction Amendments, the huge African American participation in both state politics and indeed sending uh, members to Congress and to the Senate. And we see this as a, as a light, as a potential, as, as something that was transformative in many respects. However, what we also see is that by the end of Reconstruction, this brief moment in the sun has been eclipsed uh, and African Americans in many respects are tied to the same soil that they were tied to during the days of slavery. They are oppressed, brutalized. Um, white Southerners are beginning to, to solidify a system of segregation which keeps African Americans in a certain place in society. And the rights that they were given by the radical Republicans, the rights that they had fought so hard for themselves during the Civil War and before, were being eroded not only by white Southerners, but were also about to be eroded by the federal government that was losing interest in trying to protect the rights of African Americans. We know that the struggle over the place of African Americans in Southern society began during the Reconstruction period and that some element of de facto segregation uh, emerged almost immediately after the end of the Civil War. Attempts by white Southerners to create a distance between the social spaces of African Americans and white Southerners was part of Southern society during Reconstruction and thereafter, but that this was largely de facto in the first instance, that the majority of the segregation was by social custom. It was not until 1896 in the Plessy versus Ferguson case that the Supreme Court said that separate but equal facilities were in fact constitutional. This came after the Supreme Court had undermined the 14th Amendment with the slaughterhouse cases and the civil rights cases. So what we see from the 1890s onwards is the federal government giving 
southern state governments a green light to therefore put on the statute book um, a full system of de jure segregation that separated white and black people in almost every aspect of society in the south and it was the failure of Henry Cabot Lodge's force bill in 1890 which six years before the Plessy versus Ferguson decision signalled the end of attempts by Northern Republicans to try and protect the rights of African Americans. And so the Jim Crow system of segregation in its legal sense was developed from the 1890s through the early part of the 20th century. And this locked white and black people into separate spaces in the, in the South. But what the Jim Crow system also did is bring with it cultural stereotypes of African Americans that demeaned African Americans intelligence, demeaned their ability to act as rational human beings, criminalized them, um, it saw them as savages and it took away their humanity and their sense of dignity and the stereotyping of African Americans went alongside this feeling amongst white southern males that they needed to protect white southern womanhood from the myth of the African American rapist and part of the Jim Crow segregation system was a brutal system of racial violence a brutal regime of lynching, uh, all in the name of protecting white women from black southerners. And a lot of this was some sort of psychological compensation for white southern men who lost the civil war on the battlefield, but could now somehow reclaim their manhood by protecting their women folk from this mythical racist beast, this savage of African American manhood and almost all lynchings were based on the premise that the victim had transgressed some sort of um, racial mores that dictated that black men could not approach white women um, could not be anywhere in the vicinity of white women and we see brutal images of lynchings throughout the 1890s and beyond through, through this system of segregation and through the extreme racial violence that you've seen some examples of there what essentially was happening in the south was that southern society was trying to make whiteness they were trying to make a white space in society whereas previously that slavery had been the, the line that separated black and white people. With no slavery, segregation needed to redefine that line of separation between white and black people. And by playing on white fears of, of the black rapist, by stereotyping black men, by demeaning black culture and black characteristics, what the white power structure in the South was doing was encouraging white people to buy into this system of racial segregation which would also solidify the uh, power of the white elite and the business interests in the South. So what the Jim Crow segregation system meant in terms of it being codified and it being put on the statute books in a de jure sense in the 1890s, yes it meant social separation but also it was a way of solidifying political power for the white elite in the south and it's this system of Jim Crow segregation that dismantles uh, all of the progress that had been made um, in terms of the development of African American civil rights as a result of the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment. The Jim Crow system is designed to nullify any positive impact of those Reconstruction Amendments. There were heroic African American leaders 
who struggled against the racial oppression of the South. Uh, chief among them Ida B. Wells, who campaigned vigorously against lynching, who toured Europe as well as the United States and drew attention to the terrible cases of lynching. Um, she was inspired to do so because of the death of some of her friends in terrible examples of lynchings and racial violence. Ida Wells was a tireless campaigner against racial violence and against lynching throughout the 1890s um, and didn't join any of the mainstream civil rights organizations because of her outspoken and controversial at times approach to the struggle for African American civil rights. She, her ideas could not be contained by a single civil rights organization. And she not only shined a light on racial violence, but she also blazed a trail for African American women and their place of leadership and their place of influence in the struggle for black equality. Ida Wells is also evidence of the reality that African Americans were not passive victims in the face of the Jim Crow South. Booker T. Washington was perhaps the most influential African American leader of this period. Uh, his biography, Up From Slavery, encouraged African Americans to seek progress through education. His founding of the Tuskegee Institute um, and his championing of vocational education for African Americans endeared him to many white political leaders at the time but also meant that he was criticised for being too accommodationist. Washington however was a realist and he was aware that any attempts at racial integration in the South, any attempt to really push back against the Jim Crow system would have probably ended in even more terrible racial violence. So Washington is important in helping to establish a black education system, helping to uh, establish black business enterprises and he says in his 1895 Atlanta Compromise speech that African Americans should put down their buckets where they are and they should try and work hard and develop economic power so that they can advance. He disagreed with W.E.B. Du Bois who was more in favour of an integrationist approach but Washington realised that this was not realistic and Du Bois had the advantage of being educated in the North, he received a PhD from Harvard, um, Du Bois was an intellectual um, and he didn't possibly understand the same realities of life in the South as Booker T. Washington did and so his work and his writing about integration and his founding of the Niagara Movement and then of the NAACP was important but it contrasted with Booker T. Washington and we could argue that Washington had a, a more realistic approach for his time period than Du Bois but Du Bois is, is also crucially important because of the foundations that he lays for the civil rights movement in the future and the NAACP remains the oldest civil rights organization still in existence. So obviously um, Ida Wells, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois played a really important role. Their leadership in this period was important and it shows that African Americans were not sort of passive victims of whatever was being um, done to them by white society but that there, were, um, there was an active conversation in the African American community about how best to pursue their rights. This um, disagreement between Booker T. Washington and uh, W.E. Du Bois, an accommodationist versus an integrationist approach, was part of this 
um, wider debate within the African American community. But we must also remember that African Americans themselves, ordinary people, through the development of education, the literacy rate improving for African Americans, through the foundation and development of African American churches, the development of African American culture. This was really, really important in developing a sense of African American identity and also a sense of dignity. So yes, segregation was about white people separating themselves from black people, about making a white culture, but African Americans, through no choice of their own, through being um, subjected to this system of segregation, also carved out their own business interests, their own churches, their own education systems, and these were crucial to sustaining African Americans um, throughout the what Martin Luther King talked about, the long night of injustice that was the Jim Crow system. There was a paradox at the heart of the African American World War One experience. The soldiers who fought at the front fought with incredible bravery and showed themselves to be superb soldiers on the Western Front, were commended by the French. Many were given the highest military honour by the French and yet they were in segregated regiments, they were not accorded the same welcome and the same military decoration when they returned home. Here we see the Harlem Hellfighters receiving a rapturous welcome from the African American population in Harlem, but white America largely ignored the efforts of African American troops and in fact African American troops in terms of their pension, in terms of the military support that they were given after the war were treated very badly. And the paradox is that many African American soldiers saw in France a more relaxed attitude towards race relations, saw some freedom in Europe that did not exist in America and were fighting a war for democracy and were fighting a war for freedom, the type of freedom and democracy that they did not actually receive back in the United States. And so this opened many African Americans eyes to a different experience in other parts of the world and also brought home the great contradiction at the heart of American democracy. And it was during the war that many African Americans left the South in search of the better economic opportunities that were available in the North because of the war industries and because of labour shortages in northern urban centres. We know that during World War I, roughly 330,000 African Americans left the South and this was the beginning of a great migration that took place between 1915 and 1970, which saw around 6 million African Americans leave the South. So that by the time we get to 1970, only 53% of the African American population reside in the South, whereas in 1870 it was over 90%. So the stimulus for this migration to the North was partly the First World War and the improved economic opportunities, but it was also a form of protest. African Americans left the South. They got away from the terrible suffocating racial oppression of the Jim Crow system and wanted to head to something better, wanted to go North, wanted to go West to what was perceived as a promised land. Now. There were better economic opportunities in places like Chicago and Detroit and New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, but there was also racial injustice, there was also discrimination, there was residential segregation, not the same sort of um, economic and political and social inequality that existed in, existed in the South, 
but inequality nonetheless. But what this did, and what it does in terms of us understanding the black freedom struggle in the context of our course, is it changes the dynamic somewhat, because previously in this course we are thinking about the black experience as a predominantly southern experience, because over 90% of black people live in the south. What we now have is a significant and a growing black population in the early 20th century that lives outside of the south. And so this changes the racial dynamic as well as it changes the racial demographics and what African Americans faced in northern cities was a different kind of struggle, a different kind of attempt to achieve civil and political rights from that that existed in the south and what is important to note is that this also, this migration process also allows the beginning of the development of African American culture in places like Harlem, leads to the Harlem Renaissance in the 1920s, and this explosion of, of African American cultural expression is also important because it provides a counterpoint to the stereotyping and the demeaning of African Americans in a cultural sense that was very much a part of the Jim Crow system in the south the minstrel shows the depiction of african americans as childlike savages um, and so this great migration process is really important for the beginning of a, a reshaping of the black freedom struggle as we begin to look forward to the mid 20th century in this course so black the, the black experience is shaped by this great migration in many many different ways it's an expression of protest and it also changes the dynamic of African American experience in the US so by the time we get to the end of this period that we're looking at 65 to 1918 then we have a sense in which the the dynamic of the African American freedom struggle is beginning to change. Uh, the migration north is important because of the economic and political opportunities it offers to African Americans, but also because of the cultural importance of things like the Harlem Renaissance, where African American culture, poets, artists, musicians, philosophers uh, are able to express themselves in the North in a way that wasn't happening in the South. And so we see at the end of this period that we've studied this first section of the course from 1865 to 1918, the seeds of something um, for the future that we will pick up on when we come back to African Americans for the next part of the course. Now, you need to pause this video in a moment and have a go at making sure that you filled in all the notes in that that table uh, that I showed you earlier just to make sure you've got a really solid sense of the chronology of what happened you've also got a solid sense of how the different factors were at play the different themes the different um, areas of study that we've looked at in terms of the african-american freedom struggle from 1865 to 1918 Okay, so here we have a typical essay question, 25 marks. You get to, you have to choose two from three of these at the end of the civil rights paper. This question, the quality of African American leadership was the most important factor in the advancement of African American civil rights in the period 1865 to 1992. Now you did a similar little synthesis piece a couple of lessons ago, which looked at 1865 to circa 1910. The important thing is that the question has identified a particular factor in the advancement of African American civil rights. So you've got to think about how important was that factor in relation to other factors. How much did that factor have an impact on 
the social, political and economic rights of African Americans over time, how much change was there over time, and how much was that factor more or less important than other factors. So this is an answer that got 23 out of 25, so it's a high quality answer. Um, we're going to have a look at two aspects of it. First of all, we're going to have a look at this introduction, this line of argument. The leadership of African Americans in attempting to further civil rights was fundamental in garnering the media recognition and momentum necessary to create and further the African American campaign. So it was fundamental. Okay, so that's that's their argument is that African American leadership was fundamental. The media is always naturally inclined to follow the story and legacy of individuals, cases of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, those who are assassinated, their message became immortalized, and therefore their ability to achieve is continued even beyond the grave. However, it could be said that it's an overstatement to credit the sheer level of improvements for African Americans to individuals within the movement, especially when considering how organizations maintained a sustained approach to achieving progress. This argument will attempt to assess whether African American leaders on balance were the most important factor in achieving civil rights in social, political, and economic sphere. So, we have the interplay of factors here. Now, this is a real answer. You can tell that by some of the spelling errors and some of the the mistakes that are made so somebody wrote this really in time conditions and we see that there's an there's an interplay between african-american leadership and other factors like the federal government and it hints at the end that it's going to look at social political and economic so it's not going to look at this chronologically it's going to look at it thematically so in your lesson notes template you have a copy of this the three things worth annotating next to it firstly is the argument that's quite clear that African-American leaders are important. That comes in the first two sentences. The second thing to note down that comes in the third sentence is that, however, there are other factors at play here, um, not just individuals, but organizations, and also um, possibly there's a little hint towards the fact that there might be some other factors, like the government, and then the final sentence then that you're going to have to look at this socially, politically and economically. So you're going to look at it thematically. Okay, so they're the three things. African-American leadership, yes, but other factors, not just leaders. And also that they're going to look at this in a thematic way. So here we have a section of the answer which looks at social rights, looks at the... Um, development of African American social rights and it balances out the role of African American leadership versus other factors. So we see that in the paragraph on the left hand side and again you can annotate this as you go along because you have a copy of this on your lesson notes template. There is talk of Martin Luther King and the SCLC. There is talk of um, the way in which his leadership was able to protest against the Jim Crow segregation that existed and the powerful momentum that came from that. Um, there is evidence here about lynchings and evidence about the terrible racial violence that African Americans faced. And the point is made that King was able to use media influence and was able to use media coverage in a way that other African-American leaders weren't in order to get his message across. It says again the importance of a figure who is necessary and further in the civil rights movement and bringing public awareness and societal issues is demonstrated through the Rodney King affair in 1992. So it's important that an example is drawn here from 1992. So we're going all the way up to the end of the course. Um, which, although not a civil rights leader, King's use of the media does not work to, does a work to demonstrate the importance of a figurehead and bringing attention to many societal issues affecting African Americans. Rodney King was abused by the police. He was uh, brutally assaulted, and his case created a lot of media attention. And he spoke out against the problems that African Americans faced. We then look at the other sides. So that left-hand side is, is talking about King and. Um, talking about the importance of leadership in the context of media. Personally, I would like to have seen a few other examples from across the time period. I think Ida B. Wells could have been in there when they were talking about lynching. I think that Booker T. Washington and Du Bois deserve a mention. However, um, 
you know, it makes the point that leaders are important. On the right hand side, we have the, the counterpoint. So, however, to affirm that all societal development came from the work of leaders rather than organisations and the passage of legislation by the federal government clearly works to undermine the role of these in furthering rights. So it talks about the Supreme Court's role in um, cases that were brought by the NAACP. So the NAACP is an organisation, not a person, pushing for uh, change and then the Supreme Court is a an arm of the federal government um, making decisions that have an impact on African American rights in the future. It talks about the Black Panthers there. Um, we also have um, the importance, the suggested importance that leaders and organizations of themselves cannot pass legislation and so the government is important. For that again I would like to have seen a bit more in this particular section, maybe something about the Civil Rights Act in the 60s, the importance of the federal government. Um, this isn't a perfect answer by any means, but what it does show us is how evidence and knowledge is being synthesized. There is a synthesis of different factors across the time period explaining why things changed, what was the relationship of different factors to that change. So the line of argument sets out that you know on the one hand it's to do with african-american leaders and organizations but on the other hand it's to do with other factors and if we look at that from both uh, in the context of both social political and economic rights then we can see that there's an interplay of both the next section of the essay goes on to talk about politics and the section after that talk about economics and then finally there's a judgment at the end which suggests that leaders of themselves on themselves are are important they're important in in galvanizing support and getting media coverage but on their own without organizations grassroots organizations behind them on their own without a sympathetic government to pass legislation or a supreme court to rule in favor of african-american civil rights then they cannot achieve things on their own and so this brings us to the question that you are going to have a look at um, the question is, the federal government was the main factor in the advance of African-American civil rights. You'll note here, I've put a ring around it, 1865 to 1918. You can't yet do an answer that goes all the way up to 1992, because you haven't done that much um, of the course. How far do you agree? So the federal government was the main factor. The example of the answer that you just saw was that African-Americans' leaders were important. This is that the federal government was important. So you need a line of argument. Uh, I think what has been suggested throughout this um, previous three or four lessons is that the federal government is crucially important. The federal government has the power to pass legislation in a way that individuals and groups do not. And so the federal government is extremely important. But also the federal government is very important in denying the rights of African-Americans or eroding the rights. We see that with some of the Supreme Court cases like Plessy versus Ferguson. We see it with um, the eroding influence of radical Republicans and the eventual abandonment to white Southerners of the African-American cause. When we see this through the failure of Henry Cabot Lodge's fourth bill, we see it through Woodrow Wilson as president's endorsement of Birth of a Nation and a racist interpretation of Reconstruction and the segregation of federal facilities in Washington DC. So the federal government plays an important role both in advancing and stopping the advance of African American civil rights. So there's that element that needs to be covered in this answer. But the federal government on their own, without the activities of African Americans themselves, without the development of the community, education, church, without the activities of people like Ida B. Wells, Booker T. Washington, Du Bois, in their own way, African-American rights advanced because of these people as well, not just because of the government. And in fact, they, they, these people were pushing to advance African-American civil rights in the face of government pressure and oppression sometimes. So we need to think about the interplay of factors and we need to think about themes. So political, social and economic rights. So in the political sphere, the government, 15th Amendment, think about that, think about the role of African Americans themselves in 
you know, exercising their political right. Over 2,000 African Americans serve in state legislatures. Um, African Americans are sent to Congress during Reconstruction. So that is both the federal government and African Americans themselves advancing those rights, but it's also the federal government that eventually turns a blind eye to the southern state governments passing legislation that disenfranchises African Americans. So whilst in theory a lot of progress in political rights has been made between 1865 and 1918, by the time you get to 1918 a lot of those that political progress has been um, undone. In social rights, again, think 14th Amendment, think Freedmen's Bureau, think Civil Rights Act, but again, think Supreme Court, slaughterhouse cases, Plessy versus Ferguson, think about the White South being allowed to restore home rule and Jim Crow segregation, and think about African Americans pushing against that uh, so that we see segregation by the end of the period that we're talking about, but also think about migration by African Americans as a protest against that segregation and a protest against the social conditions and indeed the economic conditions because we know economically that's probably the area that African Americans um, made the least progress in because the federal government was not prepared to redistribute wealth maybe that makes the point that real legislative change real big change has to come from the federal government um, passing some legislation and they didn't do that in the economic sphere in the same way they did it in the political and social sphere. So you've got to think about how much progress was made by that point in 1918 economically lots of African Americans are still tied to the land again yes the migration is starting with more economic opportunities in the north but the vast majority of black people are still tied to the same soil that their ancestors labored on as slaves. So think about how much change was there over time, how much did things advance? Did the federal government always help or did it hinder? What other factors were important, like African Americans themselves, organisations? So you're thinking about what caused the change or stopped the change in both political, social and economic rights, but you might also want to do a little bit of analysis of whether or not there was more political more social or more economic advance for African Americans. So this is what we're talking about when we think about synthesis. We're trying to synthesize lots of ideas. How much did things change over time? Did they change more politically or socially or economically? And why did they change? Which factors were important at which times and why? So that should give you some idea about how to plan out this essay. I suggest that you need a line of argument at the start, you need a section on political rights, how you break that up into paragraphs is up to you, but you need a section on political rights that looks at the extent of change and how much of it was the federal government, how much of it was other factors, and what was the role of the federal government in stopping change. You need a section on social rights, how much change was there, why did that change take place, what stopped that change from taking place, how much was the federal government, how much was other factors. And then economic rights, how much change, why was there change or not, and what was the role of the federal government compared to other factors. And somewhere in there you might want to think about in which area there was the greatest advance and why. And then you want a judgment at the end which clearly answers the question on whether or not the federal government was the main factor or not. And maybe thinking about a particular area where the federal government was more or less influential than others. So, you're going to have a go at writing that. Uh, if you need any further help with the plan, then let me know. Um, if not, write it please, and then send it to me at the time I have indicated. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this Lesson 5 on the African American Freedom Struggle from 1865 to 1918 as part of the Civil Rights in the USA course from 65 to 92. So when you return to African Americans you will pick that up again um, at the point of 1918 at the end of the First World War and we'll go and look at the interwar years and then through to 1950. Um, the next part of the course will focus on Native Americans from 1865 
1918, and we'll be able to draw some comparisons in the experiences between African Americans and Native Americans. Until then, I hope you have enjoyed this. I hope you found it informative, helpful. Um, if you have any problems with that essay, then let me know. But you should get a sense of how you're supposed to be writing a piece of synthesis, and you've got a good example to work from, and you've got a good plan to help you. So, until next time, take care, stay safe, bye-bye.